Hello and welcome to the Cleveland Clinic. I'm Nick Spadier, one of the cardiac surgeons here at the clinic and today I have a distinguished panel that we're going to talk about the diagnosis and management of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension and with me my distinguished colleagues include Dr. Gustavo Heresi who oversees our uh, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension clinic, Dr. Michael Tong, a colleague of mine in cardiothoracic surgery who performs the operation to remove the clots and the scar, Dr. Ehab Hadadin, who is an interventional radiologist who treats patients with both acute and chronic pulmonary emboli, and Dr. Jerry Bartholomew, one of our vascular medicine specialists who is an expert in the medications needed to treat these patients. Gustavo, starting with you, what is chronic thromboembolic disease or pulmonary hypertension? All right, so it's, it's a mouthful. That's why people uh, call it uh, CTEF for short. Um, so the PH part stands for pulmonary hypertension, which simply is high lung pressures, high blood pressure inside the lungs. Just like people have high blood pressure in the arms, turns out you can also have high blood pressure in the lungs. Uh, thromboembolic is just a fancy medical term for clot and chronic means it's been there for a long time. So, so chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension is high lung pressures due to blood clots that happened sometime in the past, never went away, and that typically leads to uh, scar tissue inside the lungs, and the common symptoms of that would be mostly shortness of breath. Can you get it from smoking? Well, so smoking, as, as Jerry would tell us, is a, a, a mild to moderate risk factor for blood clots. But in terms of a risk factor specifically for CTEF for chronic clots, not really. But certainly smoking is a risk factor for blood clots. So in an indirect way, it could. So when a, a patient has pulmonary hypertension, are there medications you can use to treat them? And are those medications appropriate if they're clot-based or do you treat those differently? Yeah, so that's a great question. So pulmonary hypertension in and of itself is not a disease. It's just a term that says high lung pressure. And there are many reasons behind that. One of them is blood clots. And if you find blood clots as the reason for it, then we have these uh, very interesting uh, interventions, such as an operation to remove the clots, balloon procedures I'm sure we'll talk about, they are very effective in treating pulmonary hypertension due to blood clots. So, so if you're a patient and you have pulmonary hypertension, you have to make sure that your doctors have screened you for chronic blood clots. And again, the, the way to do that is with this test called the, the ventilation perfusion lung scan, and then putting that together with CAT scans and other imaging studies. There are other reasons for pulmonary hypertension, such as heart problems, lung problems, and there are also a group of people who have lung pressure elevation without an obvious reason or perhaps related to some conditions such as holes in the heart or connective tissue diseases and others. Only for that latter group, these medications that we have currently available are quite effective in treating pulmonary hypertension. But the key really is before prescribing a medication, the key is to understand why you have lung pressure elevation because the treatment will be very different. So, so for the most part, this disease is a, a mechanical problem that surgery or something will help more so than medicine. Absolutely, the, uh, the way that you're putting it is perfect. Uh, this is a mechanical problem that requires a mechanical solution. solution. Uh, Jerry, Dr. Bartholomew, they're, they're, the patients are often on blood thinners when we see them. Um, what's the current state of, of blood thinners that you would expect to see a patient on, or what would you, most patients with these clots would be on some form of blood, and do they need it for their entire life, or can they come off of it at some time? Sure, uh, good question. Uh, fortunately, we have multiple options now, which we didn't have before. I mean, someone was on Coumadin for life, and, uh, or if they were, they, they weren't happy because of complications from it. Uh, uh, diet affects it, their INR had to be monitored regularly, and their INRs were often all over the place. In fact, most people were only therapeutic within 60 to 70 percent of the time. So the DOACs have come on. They've also been called uh, direct oral anticoagulants or new oral anticoagulants that, are these or novel the, oral anticoagulants. Is this the ones I see on TV all the time? Yeah, like sure. your doctor about Zeralto sure, or what's sure, the other yeah. one? If you're a golfer, a world-renowned golfer, you might be advertising one of these drugs, I guess. <laughs> but that's the one you would see. And the advantage is they don't have to be monitored. Now, that's not totally true. They should be monitored 
every six months or at least once a year if you have normal renal functions with a blood count and uh, renal and liver function tests. But uh, that's a great advantage. So you can eat whatever you want. Um, you can do whatever you want, although you still are on a blood thinner, and we uh, urge patients to avoid contact sports. Uh, the length of therapy is still a, always a, a difficult question. And uh, the American College of Chest Physician Guidelines would say if you've had an unprovoked event, a venous thromboembolic event, meaning a DVT and a pulmonary embolism, and we don't know what caused it, then you should be considered for lifelong anticoagulation. And if you're a man, the risk of a recurrent clot is much higher than a woman. Uh, so men uh, often need lifelong anticoagulation. Well, that's a great answer. Mike, uh, this is an operation we do here at the Cleveland Clinic. We have quite a long history um, with it. Tell, tell the audience what this operation is, is like and, and how you do the operation. Yeah, this is, um, this is uh, a big operation. It's one of the, the bigger operations that we do in cardiac surgery. The operation typically takes about four to five hours. Um, the operation requires that we put patients on the heart-lung machine, and then once on the heart-lung machine, we will cool the patient's body from 98 degrees down to about 65 degrees. And once we're at 65 degrees, we will shut off the circulation completely, so blood will no longer be moving in the patient. And then, but having the patient cooled um, gives us the, uh, the safety that we need. It takes us about 20 minutes on each side to extract all the clots, and, um, and we need to be able to get a good extraction and get rid of as much clot as possibly can to get a good outcome for the patient. And we can only do that safely by cooling the patients. And once we have the clots extracted, we will warm the patients back up and then take them off the heart-lung machine. Now, I know that sounds scary, but we do this every day. And this is something that we do every day with uh, not just operations with uh, clots in the lungs, but also with, uh, with uh, aortic operations as well. So this is something that we have particular expertise in, and we can do very effectively with very low risk of uh, complications and mortality. That's fantastic. I, uh, Eb, I may have jumped the gun. We need a roadmap before we get in there to do the surgery or decide exactly what we're going to do. We start with maybe a VQ scan. What, it, what when when we talk to a patient, what are the, the the tests that we would get that you think is necessary to really understand what we need to do? So, um, you know, the VQ scan is the good screening tool. Um, one of the other things is we need to get some anatomical and physiological uh, uh, characterization of the disease. Uh, uh, a CT scan is, is incredibly important because that allows us to figure out the extent of the disease and um, whether uh, it is surgically accessible or not. Uh, uh, an echo uh, that's done by the cardiology department here just allows us to uh, get an idea of how much strain uh, the heart is under. Um, uh, and then uh, in certain select patients, not in all patients, where the CT scan may not necessarily give us all the information, uh, we can perform a pulmonary angiogram, which is a, a catheter that goes into the pulmonary artery to inject some dye, so you can get much more selective, uh, much detailed anatomical pictures uh, than with the CT scan that might help make the decision of uh, what the extent of the disease and what the best management strategy is. That's great. And there's also now this new uh, idea of uh, blowing up a balloon in the pulmonary artery? So uh, for certain patients, uh, you know, we, we discussed this as a team to try to decide on the best approach for, for patients who may not be a surgical candidate. The, the balloon procedure would be uh, 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 an alternative. Uh, it, it's not quite as, as definitive. It's still in its infancy, and we, we, we're not able to. It's not a one-stop shop where you can do the whole thing in one session, unfortunately. Um, it, it does require multiple procedures that are about a month apart, and for some patients, depending on the extent of the disease, you know, it might be nine, ten sessions. So this is a treatment with a balloon that can take uh, over the course of close to a year. Um, it is minimally invasive. It does require a small incision. Most of the time we're able to do it with minimal sedatives with the patient being awake, uh, but uh, we're not able to, we don't get rid of the uh, scar. We just break it apart to help decrease the stress that the scar causes. Fantastic. So for a high-risk patient, this may be an option. So Gus, a, a patient's trying to figure out where to go to have this type of therapy. They, they've been told they might have this chronic thromboembolic disease. How what should they look for to make a decision of where they have their care? Yeah, so this is a, a complex uh, disease as we are uh, discussing, and uh, pulmonary hypertension in and of itself is a somewhat obscure uh, condition that uh, 
many physicians out there uh, don't necessarily know a lot about, and so this is why across the country there are uh, many centers with uh, certain uh, expertise and experience in pulmonary hypertension, so certainly going to a specialty, you know, tertiary referral center is a good idea. And within pulmonary hypertension, really, the, the field of CTEF, of chronic pulmonary disease, is even, is even more obscure, so there are really a handful of centers across the country that that uh, have really considerable experience and expertise uh, with this. Of course, uh, Cleveland Clinic is one of them. Um, and so what we always tell people is, you know, talk to your doctors, make sure that uh, your scans and your records are reviewed by, you know, a member of our team or, or your closest CTEF specialty center. And we're always happy to you know, pick up the phone, uh, receive CDs with pictures and review them and then talk to the patients or talk to the, to the referring doctors. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. You know, from my experience, uh, it's such a complex disease, and patients often have other things going on with their lungs. So to identify a center that has expertise and focuses on it, studies it, does research on it, and has integrated a multidisciplinary team to manage it both in the diagnostic phase, the surgical intervention phase, and the post phase is really critical to getting outstanding outcomes. Right. So I wanted to thank the panelists for their time and expertise, and I really enjoyed the conversation.